know how to use that. All right, <laughs> so no worries. I'll just leave it on. We have started. Yeah. Just with this. Oh, okay. The mic works. Whoa. <laughs> All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming um, to Interactive Intelligence. This is one of our very first lectures led by Kellen and Amea. My name is Jana, and I'm one of the co-founders of Interactive Intelligence. We started about one and a half years ago, and it grew very rapidly. Um, you're not going to see me often because I actually graduated this year. I graduated with a neuroscience degree, thank you, and also a computational neuroscience degree. And so if you guys have any questions in terms of career paths and all the interdisciplinary areas in computer science as well, please do talk to me. Um, I'm going to let Carter introduce himself. He is one of the uh, main contributors, or he actually started the neuroscience artificial intelligence course that you're taking right now. So I just want to... Hey. <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, I'm Carter. Um, I did a lot of this and I helped set this up. So if there's any mistakes or things, that's probably my fault. Um, so you can blame me for that. Don't blame them. Um, but yeah, I'm a third year in CS. And if you have any questions, feel free to always reach out. I love hearing about people who are passionate. Right. Um, yeah. Oh, nice to meet everybody. Nice to meet you. Oh. And adding on to that, one of our mission is to make artificial intelligence, neuroscience, and all of these complicated fields accessible to anyone that's simply curious and passionate enough. So um, don't be afraid to ask questions and don't be afraid to learn with us, okay? No one's gonna judge you. So welcome again and thank you. We have snacks here. And for those of you that are extremely tired, I also bought one of my favorite energy bars. So <laughs> you can just come up and take one and I'll let Kellen and Amaya take it over now. All right. Okay, so welcome back, everyone. This is officially week one now. Um, last week was week zero, just to be super clear about that. So today we'll be diving into our first unit. You can find um, the unit Megadoc on the course website, as well as the schedule. And Kelland here will be presenting on PCA, which is Principal Component Analysis. So let's just do, uh, let's get into the overview for today. So first things first, um attendance might as well scan it get it out of the way uh, and these slides as you know will be publicly available um in the discord and i don't think it's on the website but it's on the discord so any hyperlinks you should be able to access yourself and just a reminder for this unit um i like every unit the synthesis question one of them any one of your choosing is due in the intro neuro ai channel on Tuesday, and then all of the synthesis questions plus the project, um, either the technical or the non-technical, don't do both, you don't need to. If you want to, you can, I guess. And that's due on Thursday in this submission form. So just take the attendance and then Kellen will get underway. Let me know if there's any issues with attendance. Okay. All right. I think with that, we will let Kellen begin. If you need, um, if you need to do attendance later, you can also find the link somewhere in the, in the pinned messages within Intro Neuro AI within that channel. You should be able to find it. Okay. Good luck. Let's click. Oh. Click. click on. Click on it. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Uh, yeah. Welcome to the first um lecture of this course. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Kelland, as you've heard, one of the TAs for this class. Um, and today we're just going to learn a little bit about what machine learning is and take a deeper dive into one of the techniques called principal component analysis. Um, when I was putting this presentation together, I wanted it to have something for everybody. So there's some pretty mathy stuff and there's some like general concepts uh, so just try to enjoy the ride. And when we come across like a big idea, I'll try to emphasize that and make sure that you take note as well. All right. So first question first, what is machine learning? Has anybody ever heard ML is just applied stats, right? You hear that all the time. Uh, or what about 
AI is machine learning. Has anybody heard that? I definitely have. <laughs> um, so while those two perspectives are kind of true, there's something that makes machine learning a little bit unique. When people are doing statistics, generally the goal is to analyze some data set and then for like some human to understand something about that data. When people are doing AI, AI is just such a broad field. Machine learning is a little part of that. So it's not all of what AI is. Where machine learning comes in is where we are doing statistics, but what we're really trying to do is to get machines to understand the information and the patterns and data, not necessarily us humans getting a better understanding of it. And in fact, a lot of the times what we're trying to do is to get machines to understand things that are completely obvious to uh, humans. Um, so let's see, discovering patterns in data automatically. Generally, what we do is we start with some data set, we choose a model, and then we optimize our model using a particular algorithm for that data set. And here's the first big idea. Machine learning is based on the data. Our model is never going to learn anything that isn't in that data set. And our model will probably learn all sorts of things in that data set that we weren't expecting it to. So machine learning is really all about these huge data sets. And it really can't be separated from that. The, the importance of your data set cannot be overemphasized in machine learning. Um, and as I said before, uh, often our goal is to have machines understand semantic information. That's sort of things that like, you know, humans can understand easily. Like, well, we have our first example. An example problem. What is the difference between a horse and a chair? What do you guys think? Pretty obvious? Anybody have some input on this one? They are both brown. They both, you can sit on both of them, yeah. They both have four legs, you know? If you were a machine and you knew nothing about the world, how are you gonna tell what the difference between these two things are? That is one of the sorts of questions that we would solve with machine learning. Um, let's see. All right, so to the next slide. We're going to solve this question with data. And our two data points are these two images to begin with. And I've just sort of simplified them here into two features. The horse has eyes and the chair is made out of wood. <laughs> Can we all agree on that? Yes. I, I think it's pretty reasonable. And so now that we have this data, we're going to turn it into a model and we're we'd like to be able to use that model to differentiate between horses and chairs. So this is how that's gonna work. We have this data set, we can turn it into a matrix. Um, realistically, any sort of tabular data can be turned into a matrix. In our data, we're taking the yeses, we're turning them into ones, we're taking the noes, we're turning them into zeros. And the way that we're going to tell whether something is a horse or a chair is we can record those two features. Does it have eyes? Does it, is it made out of wood? And we can put that into a vector. So here's an example of that. We would be taking this vector, multiplying it by this matrix, and when you multiply a vector by a matrix, what you one way of looking at it is you look at the row vectors in the matrix and you're taking the dot product with each of them. Now, when you're taking dot products between two vectors, what you're doing is you're kind of like measuring the similarity between those things. So if we look here, our first row is a horse. 
our second row is a chair. We multiply our vector by each row and we get a column vector. The first number tells us how similar it is to a horse. And the second uh, vector tells us, or the second number tells us how similar it is to a chair. Uh, so that's the basic idea here. That's how we're going to predict whether something is a horse or a chair. Um, so what do you guys think about this model? Good, bad? Yeah, go ahead. You know, I'm pretty proud of it, uh, but it does have some issues. So what would our model predict this is? Yeah, it's not made out of wood. It has eyes. That's a horse, okay? We don't want that. We want horses to be horses and chairs to be chairs, obviously. Um, so yeah, the model incorrectly classifies many images. Anybody have ideas of how we could improve it? Just like wild guesses. Yeah, go ahead. Expanding the data set. That's one. What about another idea? Yeah. Looking at horses, wood, and eyes. Yes. All right. Those are the two that I put here. So collect more data, data points with richer features. And I just came up with this list of eight features um, to collect from images. Does it have eyes? Is it wood? Does it have, have hair? Does it have four legs? Is it inside? Is it moving? Is it shorter than four feet? And does it have a harness? So then I took more images and then I just did the exact same process. And we got this new matrix. So this matrix is much bigger than another one. If we, <clears throat> Okay, so what, how many features do we have in this new updated list? I can go back if you guys would like. Yeah, we've got eight. So we know we have eight because that's the dimension of the row space right here. Each, each row vector is an example, is a photo, each number in that vector is one of the features that that photo has. Uh, what about the dimension of the column space or what I'm gonna call the class space? It's nine, right? Because we have nine examples. So we have that one, that one, that one. If you count them all, it's nine. <laughs> uh, and let's say you take an eight dimensional vector, uh, of ones and zeros, and you do matrix multiplication with this matrix right here, what would it tell you? What would it be telling you? Remember that in our last example, we had two rows, and when we did matrix multiplication, we got a new vector, two numbers, the first number told us how similar it is to a horse, the second to a chair. So what would this one tell you? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. So did everybody hear that? It was how similar it is to each example. Now, that would be nice to know, but it doesn't really inform us about anything because you know, if we have like 10,000 examples and we just are looking, okay, this thing is like kind of like the first picture. This thing is kind of like the second picture. It's not like we're extracting any information and like really learning anything. So my question for you guys is, how do you think you could improve this model? What would be like a good thing to attempt to do? 
Any just wild guesses again? Yeah. Yeah, ideally we want to reduce the dimensions of our class space so that there's only two classes, horses and chairs. And what we want is that when we predict with a by multiplying a vector against the matrix, it'll either end up in the horse vector or it'll end up in the chair vector. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh. Uh, well, we're gonna get there. Uh, let me see if I'm missing anything. Do, do, do. All right. Yeah. So this is what we want to do. You can see this graph over here. And you can imagine the X and the Y axis. Those are the two numbers of the feature space. So X could be like how hairy this thing is. Y could be like how many legs this thing has. Just two features. Now, we can plot each of our data points in this feature space just to visualize it, right? So you can imagine each of those data points being associated with an image, and they're all plotted according to how they are rated on those features. Now, you might notice that this data is pretty linear, right? It follows this nice line. There's even this line drawn out for you right here. So I want you to imagine for a second, what would happen if you took all this data that's spread out like this and you projected it down onto this line right here? In particular, how many numbers would it take to describe the location of any data point if they're all on the same line? What do you guys think? So what I'm asking you is if you project all the data onto the same line, how many numbers would it take to describe where each data point is? Go ahead. Yeah. So it would only be one because we can take the center as zero. We can like, you know, say, okay, however far that way it is, it's like a positive number. And if it's on this side, we just give it a negative number. And that'll tell us, you know, where our data point is on that line. The real question though is how do we choose a good line? Because if we have a good line, we can project down to it we can describe our data with fewer numbers. Yeah. The problem also is that here we're just considering like how like for instance Perry is it or how many legs it has, right? Yeah. But if we want more dimensions, then how do we plot it on I'm guessing we don't have like a 10 dimensional graph. Yeah, well, it's very difficult to visualize too. I mean, in the example that we were working on before, we have eight features. Okay. That would be an eight-dimensional space. I can't visualize that. I don't know about you guys, but uh, unfortunately for me, that's like just my life, I guess. So yeah, uh, another benefit of pushing this data down into and squeezing it into smaller dimensions is that it becomes easier for us to visualize. Um, okay, so what our goal is, is to find these good vectors that characterize the data well, um, and then just project it down into there and see what we get. All right, this is the pretty mathy bit. Um, this is just a math fact. I'm just gonna ask you guys to accept this, and it's true, um, but you're just gonna have to take my word on, on it. We can, if you are curious about the proof, uh, we can look at that later. So if we take any matrix, it doesn't have to be square. It can be rectangular. It doesn't really matter. We can transform it or we can decompose it into one change of basis 
one stretching and projection vector and another change of basis. And what a change of basis does is it does exactly what we were looking to do. It just finds a new set of vectors to describe the data by. So a change of basis in the feature space would find a new set of features, which are a linear combination of the features you started with to describe your data. The stretching matrix just takes each of those and it stretches it a bit. And then this last one, it's another change of basis to this matrix. So the stretching one projects it into your class space. And then you do another change of basis there. So it's just, you can forget about that class one really. It's kind of an ugly fact, but um, <laughs> the important part is all matrices have this decomposition where it's rotation, finding a new set of features to describe your data by, and then stretching of those features. So here I've applied this decomposition to our matrix. And here is the change of basis in the class space. Here's the stretching matrix. Here's the change of basis in the feature space. And what I want you to pay attention to is this one right here. So can anybody tell me if I take the first, uh, yeah, if I take the first column vector of this change of basis in the feature space and I multiply it by this matrix, what will I get? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we just scale it by 4.6. If we do the second one, what do I get? We scale it by 2.6. Now, what I want you to look at is this one right here. So if we take the last one, what do we get? We take the last vector in this uh, change of basis and we multiply it by this matrix, what happens to it with this value? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it just disappears. And what does that mean? The feature doesn't matter at all. You know, we have eight features and what this matrix is telling us is the last one is pointless. It doesn't tell us anything about uh, our data. Well, this one, it's 0.4. So it's telling us something about our data, but not that much. And you can see these things are ranked by how big of a number they are. So the bigger the number, the more important that feature is going to be for describing our data. And what we're gonna do now is we're just gonna get rid of the ones that don't matter that much. We're only gonna keep the two most important ones. So let's go there. Um, yeah, I just wrote this out. I wrote MS for M simplified. Um, here we have our feature change of basis, and we've only kept first two, the first two columns. Here in the S matrix, because we're only keeping the first two columns, we only need the first two dimensions. And then here for the class matrix, um, you know, we, we have to we have to cut that one down too so it all works mathematically. But that's how we've simplified our M matrix. Notice it's still an eight by nine matrix, but oh, I think I have this on the next slide actually. Yeah, so it's still an eight by nine matrix. But if we start with an eight dimensional matrix, that first simplified F will take that eight dimensional matrix 
and project it down to a two-dimensional space. Then we go to a, from a two-dimensional space to another two-dimensional space. And then we go from a two-dimensional space to a nine-dimensional space. But because we only are going from two to nine, we're not going to fill up that entire nine-dimensional space. We can only fill up two dimensions. Of it. Um, so what we end up with is we have we have our original vectors, but when we look at the class space, all of our data is going to be sitting in a two-dimensional subspace of it. So you can think of that as like, okay, the class space is nine dimensions, but there's just gonna be like a plane in there, a two-dimensional plane that all of our data lives inside. And that means that if we can just describe our data, in terms of where it lies in that plane, we can describe our data in two dimensions. Um, yeah, this is just me explaining that subspace. Yeah, the, and it's somewhat, so the way that we're gonna recover this data is, the subspace that they're all lying in, that two-dimensional plane, is going to be the uh, subspace spanned by the first two column vectors of that C matrix. And we just have to change the basis back. And what it will do is you have a feature vector, you multiply it, you get another vector. Um, and when we change the basis back, all of these become zero. And we're left with two vectors that have, you know, actual numbers in them. And those are the two vectors that we're using to describe our data. I mean, two numbers that we're using to describe our data. So, yeah, I just kind of did that. And uh, I multiplied each of the examples by this matrix uh, that we ended up with. And this is what happened. Uh, we ended up in a two-dimensional subspace. All the horses are up there, all the chairs down here, and they're nicely separated. So that's the basic idea of what we're trying to achieve with um, PCA. If we had a, another feature vector, like another data point, we could multiply it by the same matrix and it would embed it somewhere in this space. and we would like to think that, yes, it would, if it was a horse, project it up there, and if it was a chair, project it down here. But I didn't really test out how great this thing is. Um, <laughs> this is just uh, with the examples that I used to generate it. Um, so some important things to note. Each point represents an image in the two-dimensional subspace that we projected everything into. Images that are similar in the same class, they're very close to each other or closer to each other than they are to other things. And then, do you guys remember how many examples we started with? Yeah, so we had nine photos. How many dots are there? There's only eight, right? And that's because when we projected it down to this space, some of them overlapped. So we lost that information that differentiated them. And in general, whenever you're simplifying your data like this, you're going to lose information like that. And really, there's not much you can do. Um, yeah. So that's uh, the basics of PCA. Um, yeah. Does anybody have uh, any questions about this? Go ahead. Yeah, let me show you. Um, I wish I could draw or something. Can I put one of these up?
really slow. All right, I'll run over here. So imagine that this is our principal component. Imagine that this dot and this dot are two different data points. Whenever we're doing these projections, they're orthogonal, so they're going to be at a right angle to our principal components. So these would both get mapped to this point right here. Uh, and that's exactly what happened here. One of them got mapped into another one. Uh, I don't know which one it is, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, does that make sense? Is there a way to figure out which one is this? Yeah, well, I was screwing around with it before, and I did figure it out by just, like, uh, mapping them each individually, but I forgot which it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? All right. So this week's project, let's look at this one. This week's project, uh, you guys are going to be learning how to implement PCA uh, using Python. And you're going to compare PCA with other similar algorithms that do similar things. So PCA works really well when those differences between when, when your data is like all linear, but when it's nonlinear, it's not going to work so great. Um, and that's something that you'll learn about in the project. And like, like we were saying at the beginning, one synthesis question due on Tuesday, and then all your synthesis questions and the project are all due on Thursday. Um, so yeah, that's all I got. Oh. Yeah, so also in addition to that, we're gonna be doing a 